This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. This is episode 99, the seventh part of the history of the six-day races, running as far as you can in six days. In this episode, in 1876, Edward Payson Weston heads to England to race against the best that the Brits could offer. It wasn't pretty. The six-day challenge originally started in England during the late 1700s. Fifty years later, in the 1820s, a six-day frenzy occurred as many British athletes sought to reach 400 or more miles in six days. See episode 91. But then, six-day attempts were essentially lost for the next 50 years. Surprisingly, it was the Americans who resurrected these events in the early 1870s and brought them indoors for all to witness. The Brits believed they owned the running sport, and surely their athletes were superior and could beat the upstart Americans, Edward Payson Weston and Daniel O'Leary. It was written, They cannot be expected to be much better than those bred in England. The British attitude toward Americans in athletics at the time was characterized in one of their sporting newspapers. Americans have long looked upon us as being far behind the times. While they have prided themselves on their ability to go ahead of all creation, there can be no doubt that we have on all occasions shown ourselves fully equal to them in all branches of sport. Another explained it this way. We Englishmen only believe what we see of the Americans is the extreme untruthfulness of American sportsmen. We are not in the least degree jealous of their athletic prowess. We are only skeptical. And this British guy standing next to me, I don't know this guy. I've never met this guy. He looks at them, and then he looks at me, and he just goes, Ugh. (laughs) Americans. In England, pedestrianism was not limited to walking. It included distance running and short distance sprint running, but interest at the time was low. British sports writers doubted the results of the December 1875 Western O'Leary six-day race in Chicago won by O'Leary. See episode 98. A respected British sports writer wrote that they needed to see it with their own eyes to believe it. Either O'Leary is a wonder of endurance such has never been before even dreamed of, or he isn't. Indoor running competitions were not yet taking place in England, and it was believed that there were many British professional athletes who could beat the Yankee horses, Weston or O'Leary, easily on roads outside rather than in comfy, loopy indoor accommodations, events which they referred to as dreary tromps. The Brits challenged O'Leary to come to England and to walk a mid-distance race against their champion walker, William Perkins. But O'Leary insisted on a distance above 100 miles. Back and forth challenges were issued and finally O'Leary agreed to race Perkins in home and home 100 milers during 1876. A British sports writer wrote, O'Leary will have to do something very smart in walking if he is to have any chance of defeating our little wonder. They thought the Yankees were, quote, cute, but did not stand a chance against Perkins. But it would be Weston who would first compete against the Brits. He and his wife boarded a steamer and arrived in England on Christmas Day, 1875. A few days later, he headed for the London Athletic Club at Lily Bridge. Why had Weston traveled to England? He mentioned mistreatment during his walks in America. His chief object in coming to this country, the home of his ancestors, was to obtain a fair record of his capabilities of what he is able to do as a long-distance walker, his own countrymen refusing him the favor, and we trust he is satisfied with the reception he has met with. Pedestrian historian Matthew Algio said, Brits still considered themselves the inventors of the games, and they were very suspicious of Weston. For one thing, they didn't believe some of the records that he had claimed to set, walking 100 miles in 24 hours, for instance. 
They just thought maybe these were outright fabrications or there could be a problem measuring distance or time, that sort of thing. And also, Weston got on their nerves because he kind of embodied everything that the Brits hated about Americans. He was flashy, he was cocky, he would play the cornet while he walked. He was kind of like the Muhammad Ali of his era. He would really play it up to the crowd, ham it up. This was really not considered sportsmanlike by the Brits. And so it further added fuel to the fire of anti-Western sentiment. In Dublin, Ireland, it was written, Every true Briton has laughed to scorn the bragging of Weston, the great Yankee pedestrian who has blown his own trumpet so loudly that its echo has reached across the Atlantic and told us how he could walk around the shores of Great Britain. Weston was in England for more than a month before he was able to finally put together a walking expedition. A dozen American residents in London asked him to perform and likely offered funding. Weston quickly responded and announced that on February 8, 1876, he would attempt to walk 115 miles in 24 hours. He then issued a friendly challenge to Perkins to race against him to win a silver cup that Weston was putting up. Perkins accepted cheerfully. The historic race would be held in the Royal Agricultural Hall, Islington, London, the first of many ultra-running races to be held inside that structure. This 24-hour race would kick off the golden age of pedestrianism in England and would open the door to six-day races outside of America. The Agricultural Hall was a massive building with an impressive arched roof of iron and glass. At night, the interior was lit by 4,000 gas lights with the addition of several giant illuminated chandeliers that hung from the ceiling. It became London's primary public venue for many types of shows. By 1876, it was used by trapeze artists, bicycle races, horse races, religious services, country fairs, and cattle shows. It could be configured to accommodate up to 18,000 spectators, and now, for the first time, walkers would compete in it. William Perkins, age 23, was described as the fastest walker we had ever had in England. He was 5 foot 6, weighed 132 pounds, and a smart looking young man with broad shoulders and a short back, and had very muscular thighs. Even though he was the champion, his walking career had covered only a few years. He had worked his way to fame very quietly since 1869 at the age of only 17 and appeared in several short distance walking races. In 1874, he won a three mile race giving him his champion title. He had recently walked eight miles in under an hour, an achievement considered by the British as being the quote, summit of pedestrian accomplishments. But Perkins' long walk up to that point was only about 20 miles. As the historic race came closer, there was worry among the British sportsmen. W. Perkins is only famed for going short distances with great speed, and it remains to be seen if he will be able to stay. Excitement grew. At last, Englishmen have the opportunity of judging for themselves the capabilities of the American walkers. Two tracks were prepared inside the agricultural hall. Weston's inner track was composed of dirt on wood, seven laps to a mile, and Perkins unwisely chose for his outer track to be composed of only hard, bare wood, six and a half laps to a mile. The event, the first of its kind in the agricultural hall, was promoted as a dignified affair. Both men will be dressed in chaste and genteel apparel, Nothing stronger than coffee will be sold at the bar, smoking is positively forbidden in the building, and hundreds of ladies belonging to England's proudest nobility have already promised to be present. The race started at 9.25 p.m. on February 8, 1876, in front of 5,000 spectators in the massive hall. Perkins went out very fast and at 15 miles held a lead of about a mile. The British were thrilled to see Perkins building a nice lead. It at once became apparent that Perkins is far better than his opponent. Perkins' style is simply perfect, with long rapid strikes, striking well out from the hips. Weston, on the other hand, 
reminds one of a country farmer swinging along trying to make up for lost time. By police policy, the hall had to be cleared by spectators at 12.30 a.m., and servants went through the building ringing handbells signaling that it was time to exit. But many ignored the order, and policemen made efforts to chase down offenders who would even hide in the roof rafters. Numbers of people concealed themselves in the gallery and other secluded spots, and a succession of chases and captures helped to pass away the tedious hours. Meanwhile, the men plowed steadily on. After all had been cleared out except for the walkers, handlers, judges, and press, the only audible sounds were the tread of the pedestrians and the voices of the judges marking the lapse and time. As the small hours drew on, the pedestrians pursued their monotonous pilgrimage through the gloom like phantoms of the night. At 5 a.m., the public was allowed back into the hall. Some had anxiously waited all night out in the cold by the gates. Perkins was at 39 miles, with Weston about one mile behind. At 50 miles, Perkins' lead was 18 minutes. But soon, Perkins crashed and burned as his feet developed terrible blisters from walking on the hard surface and because he had never trod that long distance before. Perkins' boots were full of blood, and his bloody socks had to be cut off his feet. That's gross! He finally quit after reaching 65 miles, and Weston went on to reach 100 miles in 21 hours 55 minutes with loud cheers and finished with 109 miles in the allotted 24 hours. He walked an extra lap as officials cleared the way for him with umbrellas and sticks, and then he was, quote, fairly mobbed by the adoring crowd. The crowd outside increased, and they broke down the doors and filled the hall, cheering the victor loudly. Many British skeptics were finally convinced and ate a piece of humble pie. We candidly admit that Weston is par excellence in this particular branch of pedestrianism, the very best man we have ever seen. Much as we pride ourselves on our national pluck and endurance and the invincibility of our athletic champions, in this great international walking contest we have to acknowledge a defeat, the palm of victory having been carried off by the American. All staunch patriots are somewhat crestfallen today. Our champion walker has been beaten by the champion walker of America. Perkins was also humbled and admitted that he had been beat easily by Weston in, quote, a performance that has never been equaled in this country. He knew that no pedestrian in England had a chance keeping up with Weston until they did proper strict training for ultra distances. Perkins wisely canceled the match with O'Leary that was scheduled for March. Loser. Ultra distance pedestrianism fever took hold in England. It was time for British athletes to wake up and not let the Americans beat them at the sport originally created in England. Did America notice? Yes, they did. The first transatlantic cable had been laid, I think it was about 10 years before, and newspapers would print extra editions or have big chalkboards out front that they would do lap-by-lap updates of where the competitor stood. You could follow in real time on both sides of the Atlantic. It was joked that Congress would introduce a bill to have an oil painting of Weston's legs be hung up in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Detroit cruelly added, The suggestion can much be improved upon by hanging Weston himself in the rotunda, legs and all. Yes, many newspapers couldn't help themselves and take shots at Weston. In Detroit, the headline was, Weston the pedestrian finds a worse failure than himself. In Cincinnati, Ohio, Aha! Our American pedestrian Weston has beaten the English champion. Now it is time for him to die, covered with glory, and the five pounds he has won will cover his funeral expenses. Weston issued more challenges. He next soundly beat Alexander Clark in a 48-hour race. Clark had previously held the fastest snow time in England, walking 15 miles, 
but could only manage 54 miles against Weston, who reached 180 miles. Weston even played God Save the Queen at times on his cornet as he walked. During this race, a spectator fell from the girders under the roof, breaking his arm in three places and losing some teeth. He was rushed to the hospital, frightfully mutilated and insensible. How would Weston perform competing against a true runner? Next up was a 75-hour match against Charles Rowell, a Cambridge rower who would eventually become one of the greatest ultra runners ever. He was allowed to run as Weston walked and went out to an early big lead. But on this occasion, even with running, he was no match for Weston who crushed him with 275 miles to 176. Weston next wanted to prove to England how far he could walk in six days. With only 10 days of recovery since his 275 mile walk, a six-day race was scheduled for the Agricultural Hall. Weston offered a cup valued 100 pounds to anyone who could walk further than him in six days. Many men sent letters to the Sporting Life newspaper applying to compete, but when race day came, only two daring runners showed up at the start. Alfred Taylor, age 32, was a former soldier who had experienced going on a march walking 50 miles a day for six days in the hot sun while stationed in India. James Martin, age 52, was also a former soldier and war hero who served in India and Crimea. He was a veteran ultra runner, the current 50 mile world record holder, which he set back in 1863 of 6 hours 17 minutes. The rules for the race stated that if either man fell behind Weston by 50 miles, they had to stop, but could appoint a replacement walker, as was in the first six-day race in the Hippodrome a year earlier. See episode 95. The race started on March 6th, 1876 at 12.03 a.m. As the big clock chimed 12, men stationed at different parts lit the gas simultaneously, and the men immediately came out on the course, Weston taking up his position on the inner track, and Martin and Taylor on the outer. Weston was in his usual velvet garb, the others dressed in green, wearing cricketer caps. Weston walked in the opposite direction on the track than the other two. Taylor started out in the lead, walking fast with an 11.10 mile. Martin took a bad fall around mile 7. He fell forward onto his face near the western end in a fainting state, but after cold water was applied to his head and neck, he was able to resume his journey after a stoppage of about three minutes. He went on to really struggle during the night. At 10 a.m., Weston was at mile 47, Taylor 45, Martin 23. After 70 miles, Weston stretched out his lead. He reached 95 miles during the first day. On day two, after 36 hours, Weston had walked 128 miles, Taylor 95, and Martin 60. Martin had fallen behind more than 50 miles, but was allowed to continue, however no longer eligible for any prize. Later in the afternoon of day two, Martin, in accordance with medical advice, was ordered to leave the track, his place supplied by a man called Newman. Hello, Newman. Taylor was ordered to bed by the judges in consequence of his prostrate condition and told to rest until morning. W. Newman had previously won two 20-mile races. He started when Weston was at 158 miles and went out at a tremendous fast pace. At the end of day two, Weston had reached mile 173. In the morning of day three, all three were back onto the track. Taylor had rested for more than 13 hours and, contrary to the advice of his friends, foolishly resumed walking again. Through the morning, he halted continually and struggled in deep pain. By 1 p.m., Weston was at 209 miles, Taylor 120, and Newman 50. Reporters used a mobile telegraph office that was set up on the north side of the hall 
where they could send reports to newspapers all over the world. At noon, the medical staff declared that Taylor was unfit to continue. He protested, but was ordered by the judges to leave the track. Get out! His total distance was 122 miles. It was said that Weston's competitors, quote, had subsided like mist before the rising sun. During the evening, Weston and Newman put on a show for the crowd of 2,000, doing several sprints against each other. Weston reached 243 miles by the end of the third day, and bets were 4-1 to one against his ability to still reach 500 miles. Weston reached 318 miles on day 4. At times, he would ask the band to play soothing, quiet tunes like The Sleep of Diana before turning in for some sleep. <sighs> At the end of day 5, he had reached 387 miles, far off the target for his hoped-for 500 miles. On the final day, a staggering 16,000 spectators crowded into the building to watch. Toward the evening, the number of visitors kept constantly increasing, and their presence and applause visibly cheered the tired pedestrian. Handkerchiefs were waved to inspire him further. Bravos and other familiar salutations greeted his progress at every step. To these, Weston constantly responded, kissing his hand and pressing his heart in acknowledgement. Spectators went crazy when he marched around with the band, playing his cornet, stopping at the judges' stand to play The Last Rose of Summer. When the pistol fired, signaling the end of 144 hours, Weston had reached 450 miles. He climbed into the judge's box and gave a short speech, thanking everyone for their kindness and expressed his affection for England. The great sportsman, Sir John Astley, who would in the future play a prominent role in the promotion of six-day races, was in the box and congratulated Weston. Weston was carried away in triumph to a room in the hall to get some rest. Newman ended his walk with an impressive 190 miles in a little less than four days. A week later, a British doctor who observed Weston during the six-day race revealed that he had seen Weston chew on coca leaves that were likely obtained from South America. The doctor confronted Weston twice during the race about it, and he declined to comment. He had tried to hide his use from the doctors. Later, Weston begged the doctor to say nothing about it, but it all came out. Chewing the coca leaf. You're going to chew now and then, not all the time, right? Like chewing gum, just one side, don't switch on me. Finally, the scandal forced Weston to write a letter to a London newspaper. He admitted that he also chewed on the coca leaves during the 24-hour race with Perkins and said they did not enhance his performance, but only helped him prepare to sleep. Yeah, right. He also admitted to using them in previous events in America and saw no problem using them. No problem. Surprisingly, the British seemed to accept his explanation. America's reaction was less forgiving, and coca was touted as being the secret to Weston's endurance. Within a month, professors at Edinburgh, Scotland, tested the use of coca with endurance walking and discovered that it reduced the pulse and fatigue. Over the years, the use of coca leaves has proved to act as a mild stimulant that suppresses hunger, thirst, pain, and fatigue. Its alkaloids are a source of cocaine, and now the leaves' use are illegal in the U.S. and banned by the World Anti-Doping Code. Reaction in Britain to the highly publicized six-day race was similar to what had occurred in America. Others, even without proper training, wanted to get into the action by attempting to walk six days, trying to do better than Weston. Joseph Spencer was the first, trying to walk 110 miles in 24 hours in the agricultural hall. But after 22 hours and only 75 miles, he could barely walk and was carried off the track, quote, in a helpless condition. The Sporting Life newspaper in London explained a couple months later in May 1876. Before Weston came over and put long-distance walkers on their metal, 
a walking race of over seven miles was a rare occurrence. But since the Americans' exhibition of endurance, there has been a number of matches, and all distances have been decided in various parts of the country. Though only a few instances were the performances at all noteworthy, many began to believe that we had no men in the country able to cope successfully against the American at any distance over 50 miles. To solve this embarrassment, British athletes were further encouraged by prize money raised by the owners of the Agricultural Hall, quote, to see if England can produce a better pedestrian than the American representative Weston and race for 24 hours. About 100 men sent in applications to participate. 16 were selected and 14 started. Weston declined to participate on the single shared track and he likely feared defeat. On May 8, 1876, the British ultra walkers were finally successful in England's first great walking match of 24 hours, attended by 5,000 spectators. Harry Vaughn, age 29, broke O'Leary's 100 mile walking record in 18 hours 51 minutes and also broke Weston's 24 hour world walking mark of 117 miles, reaching 120 miles. Vaughn returned to his home as a national hero. The British were on their way to compete again in ultra running and finally had taken the wind out of the American walkers' sails. Stay tuned for more six-day race history.